her undivided attention as she develops the theme, Decisions You Face, How Will You Make Them? For the week. needed the money. Uh, his job simply was not paying him enough to cover his bills. His wife had, had to come off the pioneer list to help him pay the bills by getting a full-time job. So when his boss offered him a promotion, he was one happy man. Ah, but there was a downside. With the more money and more prestige, it was going to come more time. It was going to cut into his meetings. It was going to make it very difficult for him to go on service. So what would he do? Richard had a decision to make. Nora was an attractive sister in her mid-twenties, and she used to complain that she'd go on the job and the men would not leave her alone. And she'd go to the Kingdom Hall and the brothers wouldn't give her the time of day. Sound familiar? Anyway, one day she got into a conversation with a fellow that worked in a butcher shop. The conversation led to a romance. Before long, she was head over heels in love with this fellow, and she went to one of the elders and said, well, what do I do? And he explained, what well, comes down to this, if you keep seeing him, it's going to involve either marrying out of the truth or getting involved with sexual immorality, or you can break off the relationship. What would she do? Nora had a decision to make. Now, these are real-life situations, and they illustrate the many situations facing the older people. Now, what should I do? Should I accept that job? Should I have my wife work full-time? What music should I listen to? What clothes should I wear? Should I rent to buy a home? On and on and on the decisions go, and some of our brothers confront these situations with great decisiveness and make bad decisions. Nora, for example, was quite decisive. She knew exactly what she wanted. She wanted that young man. And within a matter of weeks, she found herself before a judicial committee at the practice of immorality and had to be fellowshiped from the congregation. And we would see her year after year. Once in a while, she'd come to the hall with her two uh, illegitimate children. The man, oh, he left her ages took her almost 10 years to get back into the truth. There are others, though, that won't make a decision at all. They take the, the uh, course of procrastination. Apparently, they think if they ignore the problem long enough, it'll just go away, or it will resolve itself. Well, the Bible warns against this course of action, too. Now, please open your Bibles to James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. And we're going to look at this scripture with a bit of depth. James chapter 1. And here we see a warning against the course of indecisiveness. There we read, James chapter 1, verse 5, it says, So, now whenever you're reading your Bible and you come across a transitional phrase like so, consequently, therefore, ask yourself the question, so, what? What is it a consequence of? Well, if you look at the context, look at verse 2. He says, consider it all joy when you meet with various trials. So James is discussing trials and decisions that may come up as a result of facing these trials. He says, so, if any one of you is lacking in wisdom, that's the wisdom to cope with a trial, the wisdom to cope with a, dis a bad situation and make a wise decision. What should you do? Let him keep on asking God. Interestingly, not simply ask of God, as the King James Version put it, the New World Translation brings out the flavor. Let him keep on asking God. It's continuous. That shows that we really care. It shows Jehovah that this situation really concerns us. And then it says, for he gives generously to all. Have you ever thought of this, that God is generous? generous. He's not like that ungenerous man mentioned in Proverbs 23 verse 6 where Solomon says don't don't take the food of this man of ungenerous eye. You know there are people that say, here have this, take it, but you can tell they don't really want you to have it. And if you do take it, you really hadn't. But God is not like that. He's generous wholeheartedly in giving, especially giving wisdom. And he says he gives without reproaching. 
In other words, he doesn't make us feel stupid for having asked. He's like that loving father. Uh, perhaps he's engrossed in reading or paying bills, and along comes his son with a broken toy truck. And in the father's universe, this is pretty small potatoes. But he, he drops what he's doing, and he gives attention to that little child as if that broken truck is the most important thing in the universe. How trivial our problems must seem to Jehovah God, who's running the whole universe. But we go to him, and he never says, you know, that was a stupid thing. Could you handle that yourself? No, he gives generously without reproaching. And then James says, and it will be given him. It is of interest that very often our prayers are not answered the way we want. Sometimes the answer is no. There's no guarantee that we always will get what we want when we ask Jehovah for something. But when it comes to asking for wisdom, the Bible guarantees an answer. It will be given you. Whatever your situation, whatever your problem, He can give us the wisdom. The problem remains, but we will be helped to take a course that will do us the best good spiritually. But, cautions James, let him keep on asking in faith, not doubting at all. When we doubt, it's an insult to Jehovah. We say, well, Jehovah, you know, maybe you can help me. I don't know, I'll give it a try. Now why would you hope answer a prayer like that? Uh, we're insulting his almightiness. We're implying maybe you really aren't almighty after all. So we have to approach God with confidence. And then he says, For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven by the wind and blown about. It's like taking your child to the beach and you put a toy boat on the water. It doesn't last too long, does it? The winds and waves just take it away from him. Well, when we doubt, we're not able to commit our affairs to God. We try to give it to Him, but we hold on anyway. What happens? Well, because God is not able to intervene and help us, because we're still holding on, He steps back. And this is a frightening thought, brothers. He steps back. And He says, well, if that's the way you want it. He lets the winds and waves of life buffet us about without His help. That's a frightening thought. For James says, in fact, let not that man, that doubting man, suppose that he will receive anything from Jehovah. How much help does Jehovah give him? Zero. Nada. Nothing. Why? But he's still holding on. Jehovah, I want you to help me, but uh, I don't know about this. No help. And he explains why. It's not that God doesn't care. He says, he is an indecisive man. In the Greek, it literally means double soul. He's conflicted. He doesn't know what he wants. He's unsteady in all his ways. That's the same word used to describe somebody that's drunk. He's real and staggering. Lack of trust permeates his life. It would be pointless for Jehovah to give this man wisdom, because if he gave it to him, he probably wouldn't follow it anyway. He doesn't know what he wants, so he's left to fend for himself. Now, brothers, when you think of the winds and waves of life, and all the problems out there, it's a frightening thought to think of doing it without Jehovah's help. If we learn anything from this talk, learn this. That Bible text helps us appreciate that Jehovah blesses decisions. No decision, there's nothing for him to bless. So the indecisive one does not get God's help. While we wallow in indecision, precious time, precious opportunities pass us by. Well, as it been said, the indecision is the thief of time. So the desirable course is to be decisive, but to make good decisions. And we have a real advantage in this respect. Not because we're smarter than anybody else, not because we're better than other people, but decisions should be easier for Jehovah's Witnesses. Why? Because we've already made a key decision that is the foundation for many, many other life decisions. Most of you here have already done it. What are we talking about? Let's look at another Bible text. We're going to look at Romans chapter 12. And again, we're going to look at the scripture in detail. See if you can figure out what this decision is. 
There in Romans 12, verse 1, we read, Consequently, here we go again, another trans transitional phrase, So what? As a consequence of what? Well, look at the context. What is chapter 11 all about? Our running head at the top of page 1417 says, Grafted into olive tree. Now, if you're an experienced Bible student, that should ring some bells. Chapter 11 is where Paul discusses the merciful wage of what we dealt with the Jews and Gentiles. Uh, the Jews used to be his people. They rejected his son. And so what did he do? He had this kingdom arrangement with 144,000 branches that could have been theirs, and he locked the Jews off. Right? So what does he do? He goes to the Gentiles, well, like a wild olive tree, and he grafts them onto his kingdom arrangement. But yet, if a Jew still wanted to believe in Christ, he could get grafted back on. So the point was, Jehovah showed mercy to Jew and Gentile. Okay? Then he warned him against complacency. He said, don't get too confident because you can get locked off again. Now in chapter 12, he says, Consequently, I entreat you. Isn't it interesting that Paul entreated it did not resort to using apostolic authority. Now we know the apostles had authority. Do you remember Ananias and Sapphira? Remember that? And they forgot Peter had apostolic authority and they made a big mistake. They lied. They lied to Peter. You remember what happened? Peter kind of blinked one eye and they dropped dead. And believe me, after that, people did not lie to the apostles. <laughs> because they had authority. Now, Paul therefore could have said, as an apostle, I order you, I command you, I'm telling you, do it because I tell you. Instead, he took the low road, the humble road. He said, I entreat you. And brother, if you're an elder, father, family head, you're going to get a lot more mileage out of your authority if you entreat and ask rather than command. He says, I entreat you by the compassions of God, brother. Each and every Jew and Gentile had tasted God's compassion. To do what? <clears throat> what should God's compassion motivate us to do? To make a decision. What's the decision? Paul explains. To present your bodies. This was something new. Now as Jews under the Mosaic law, you presented bodies, but it was dead bodies. You went up to the temple with the sheep sheep, goat, or a bull, and they slaughtered it, and you offered that to Jehovah. Now under the Christian arrangement, no more dead bodies. Now we give Jehovah ourselves. He says, a sacrifice living. That means God wants you. He wants everything you have. He wants your energy. He wants your mental capacities, your financial assets. He wants you. He wants us to offer it, as it were, on an altar of sacrifice. He says he wants us to be holy, acceptable to God. No lame sacrifices, please. He wants them to be whole soul. And then he says a sacred service, and that's work related to God's service, a sacred service with your power of reason. So it's not primarily an emotional, like a tent revival kind of decision where people have worked up and say, I believe. No, it's reason. That's why we study with people. That's why if this is your first time to one of the meetings of Jehovah's Witnesses, someone has been studying with you, going over the Bible with you, so you can make this decision. And then it says, quit being fashioned after the system of things, but be transformed by making your mind over, that you may prove to yourselves the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What is this decision? Well, one word sums it up. Dedication. Dedication also dedication to God. Now, the Christians there in Rome, most were already dedicated, so Paul was telling them, live up to that decision of dedication. Dedication is therefore more than a commitment to attend meetings, or a commitment to go out in service. You can make all kinds of commitments. I'll meet you at 6 o'clock. That's a commitment. But it's not a dedication. After that little appointment, you may not see the person again. But with Jehovah, there's a commitment. We've given him everything we have. It involves disowning ourselves. This is such a heavy, profound, far-reaching decision. Does it surprise you that most people are afraid of it? As a matter of fact, thousands of people have studied the Bible with Jehovah's Witnesses. 
even after years of study, uh, some are afraid to make this decision. Over the years, I've heard three excuses. Maybe they sound familiar. Three reasons why people postpone dedication. Excuse number one. I don't see why I have to get baptized. I mean, I'm doing everything else. I'm going to the meetings. I'm even giving talks on the school. I'm going out in service. Why do I have to get baptized? I had a woman say that to me once. And let me give you my less than tactful response. I said, you know what you remind me of? You remind me of a man that says to a woman, I love you. Oh, baby, I love you so much. But why do we have to get married? Uh, you know, we can just live together, and if you get tired of me, you can leave. And if I get tired of you, I'll leave. But I love you. And women by the thousands fall for this. But somebody with a little bit of gray matter goes, no, wait a minute. And this fellow says that he loves me, and he's already figuring how to get out of this thing. Well, that's what you're telling Jehovah. I love you, but please don't ask me to commit myself or to make a dedication. But why do I have to get baptized? Why do I have to get wet? Why can't I just get on my knees and say, Jehovah, I've made this decision, I've dedicated myself to you, and that's it? Good question. Uh, let me illustrate the point here. How many of you here, by a show of hands, are dedicated baptized witnesses? Excellent. Keep your hands up. How many of you baptized witnesses remember the date of your baptism? Excellent. Keep your hands up. How many of you remember the date of your dedication? The date of your private dedication. Ooh, one, two. You don't remember, thank you. You don't remember the date of the most important decision of your life. You don't remember the day you made a dedication. Well, I don't remember either. I, said, oh, I know I made it. But if you ask me when, where, it's, it's kind of fuzzy. As Jehovah knows human nature. And you know, if he just left it up to us to make a little private dedication, you know what would happen after a few weeks of hassle and problems with the truth? You'd probably say, you know, brothers, I don't know about this dedication thing. Maybe I really didn't make it. But brothers, who can forget nervously approaching the elders and saying, I want to go over those baptismal questions? Sitting down, going over those questions with three or four different elders, uh, coming to the circuit district assembly early in the morning, sitting up front hearing that dedication talk, standing up to publicly answer those two questions, changing into a bathing suit and walking in front of all those people, and then with a prayer on your lips going beneath the waters of baptism. No way you're ever going to forget that. It's burned into your memory. Wisely, Jehovah demands that we make public declaration. Ah, but there's excuse number two. You hear this from young people. I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet. I'm not old enough yet. Oh, really? Funny thing, these same teenagers, if their feet are long enough to hit the accelerator, Dad, can I have the car keys? <laughs> I'm ready to drive. And if they find themselves attracted to one of the opposite sex, uh, I want to go out. Well, you know, dating is for those old enough to get married. I'm old enough for that. And if McDonald's will hire them, they're down there flipping hamburgers because they're old enough to work and have their own money. What about dedication? I'm not ready yet. Old enough to drive, old enough to work, old enough to date, not old enough to tell you hope you want to serve him. And we need to search our motives. Excuse number three. Maybe this is really what's going on. Excuse number three. There are still some things I want to do first. Or, a little more honestly, I'm afraid I'll get disfellowshipped. Now, some apparently have the idea that as long as you're not baptized, you can do what you want. Hey, <laughs> can't touch me. I'm not baptized. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. Not with Jehovah. James says in James 4.17, If anyone knows what is right and doesn't do it, it is sin. Knowledge brings with it accountability. So if we're caught in that merry-go-round of indecision, ask yourself, if I haven't made a dedication, why not? Do I know it's the truth? Have I tasted God's compassion? Maybe I need to talk to someone and get some help. Maybe I need to talk it over with my parents, with the elders, or with the ones studying with us to help us search our own motives. Well, we've talked a lot about dedication. Why? It is the foundation of our life decision. 
If we are truly dedicated, we are going to approach decisions differently than our next door neighbor. Now, not because we're smarter, but look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And here Paul makes a very interesting contrast between Jehovah's people and people of the world. Now, again, it's not a matter of mental superiority, but he explains in verse 14 that a physical man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. In other words, your next door neighbor, you may work at the same company. He may make more money than you. Perhaps he's even smarter than you. But he's a physical man. That doesn't mean he's a bad man. He's a physical man. In other words, his thinking is geared toward what feels good, what tastes good, what's in it for me. That's the main question that the physical man asks. What's in it for me? That's the way he's been trained to think. So when he approaches a decision, what's in it for me? Okay? So spiritual things seem foolish. If you don't believe this, try sharing spiritual things with a physical person. Uh, perhaps some of you have unbelieving mates. And these are good men. Uh, they work. They take care of you. They're loving to your children. But you know what it is to go home from a meeting and go, oh, we had this wonderful watchtower study. He goes, that's nice. And you know, I went out in service and placed 12 magazines. Okay. <laughs> he doesn't get it. He doesn't get it. He, he's not spiritual. So his approach to things is physical. Verse 15, however, the spiritual man, this dedicated man, he doesn't ask what's in it for me. He asks what is in Jehovah's interests. What is in my spiritual interest? The spiritual man examines indeed all things. He looks at things from a spiritual point of view. Therefore, he approaches decisions differently. Let's get into the mind of that spiritual man. And we're going to see how he confronts a decision. Imagine he's got to decide, what should I do? Should I move? Should I go where the need is greater? Should I find near? Should I, should I take this job? He's in this situation. Let's study his mind for a moment. What are four things a spiritual man might do? Number one, the first thing the spiritual man might do is follow the principle of Luke 14, 28, where Jesus says, calculate the expense. Now, you know, if you're going to build a home, how do you calculate the expense? Well, you got to do your research, don't you? What are the materials? How many square feet? You do your homework. That's the only way you can calculate the expense. Jehovah's people may be sheep, but when it comes to dealing with the world, we can't afford to be sheep-like. We ask questions. What do you mean? You're offering me this job and I don't have to pay taxes? What, what do you mean by that? We, we ask. We ask questions. We find out what's involved. We do some homework. What exactly am I getting myself into? Number two, the spiritual man looks to God's word for direction. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in Jehovah with all your heart. Don't lean upon your own understanding. He does research. He tries to figure out what Bible laws, what Bible principles bear on this decision. Have there been any articles in the Watchtower of the Week on this? He learns to use the Watchtower Publications Index. If he's got a computer, he's using the CD-ROM Watchtower Library. He learns to find that information. He may talk matters over with a mature Christian, and that would include a mature sister in the congregation. Not, hey, make the decision for me, but help me reason on this scripturally. What Bible principles apply? Number three, the spiritual man prays for and is sensitive to God's direction. And number four, this is the hard one. This is the big one. Number four, the spiritual man, the spiritual woman, makes a decision. Why? No decision, there's nothing for Jehovah to bless. So at some point in time, he or she bites the bullet, makes the decision. Now, let me explain something, brothers. A lot of people get hung up on this. Sometimes our brothers naively think that the perfect decision should come descending on a sheet out of heaven right into your lap. Ah, that's what I'm supposed to do. And they get hung up sometimes. Understand that at times, Jehovah lets 
us have alternatives. In other words, there isn't always the one, the only decision. Oftentimes, there's three, four, five, six different things we can do, any one of which is pleasing to Jehovah. Let me illustrate it. Here's a single sister in the, kind, in the congregation, perhaps pioneering. She's single, she's happy, leave her alone. Leave her alone. What's wrong with you? Who are you waiting for? Leave her alone. Well, that's her decision, isn't it? She pleases Jehovah, she enjoys her ministry, but as she gets past the bloom of youth, she might say, you know, I've enjoyed this, but I think at this stage in my life I would enjoy having a, a marriage made. Now, as long as she marries in the Lord, that's her decision. God's not angry at her. Jehovah will bless the marriage as long as they apply Bible principle. After a few years of being childless, they may say, you know, it would be nice to have some little ones running around. So they decide to have a child. Jehovah's not mad. Their choice. They may like the first one so much that they want another one. And another one, as long as they can afford to, to feed them a clothe them, Jehovah doesn't say, look, you've had two, now stop. <laughs> It's their decision. It's their decision. And how often times we get paralyzed waiting for this one and only decision. Sometimes it's just a matter of saying, well, okay, what what decisions are accepted, Jehovah? And what do I want to do? What, what seems the best? And go ahead and, and pursue that course of action. And if it is the wrong decision, if we're going in a way that's going to harm us spiritually, we can be confident Jehovah, some way or the other, will maneuver things to us. Now, that's that's not a good idea. But we don't have to be paralyzed to wait for a miracle. Okay? Calculate the expense. Look to God's word. Pray. Make a decision. Sounds simple? Let's try it out in real life. We're going to discuss a couple of situations that perhaps many of you face in the congregation. And let's see how a spiritual man may cope. All right? Let's take, for example, the area of secular employment. That probably involves 95% of it. Uh, employment forces us to make decisions. Shall I take that job? Does it pay enough? Mm -hmm. Are there benefits? Now, we should ask questions like that. Those are the same questions that physical man asks. Remember what he asks. What's in it for me? How much do you pay? What are the benefits? Dental? What? Fine, we should ask those questions, but the spiritual man has a couple of other concerns, like, will I make it to my meeting? Uh, will I be able to get off of conventions? You know, we explained that you know, Jews have Hanukkah, Catholics have a Christmas, Jehovah's Witnesses have conventions. Uh, what's your policy going to be on that? Well, we ask certain questions. What is the nature of this work? What will I be doing? I know a brother in the Philadelphia area that asked that question. He was in the military, big high-tech stuff, computers, you know, missile guidance systems. And uh, his wife was studying. He was an opposing husband, but he knew this was the religion for him. The day he went to the Kingdom Hall and learned in a talk that wives had to be submissive to their husband. He said, this is a great religion. I want to be one of those witnesses. He even had the nerve to try to pull the Bible on his wife. He said, look, you get baptized, then you can pull the Bible on you. So he wanted to get baptized, but realized Isaiah 2, 4, being your sword to the plowshare. They will learn war no more, that's what the Bible said. How can I be here in the military developing these guidance systems? And he prayed, made a decision to get out of the military, somehow was able to get out without going to jail or getting into trouble. It was fine, but now he needed a job. So he sends resumes all over the eastern seaboard. And some high-tech company up in Connecticut liked what he had and flew him up by jet for a job interview. Hey, this is pretty big stuff. And he gets up there, and they roll out the red carpet, and they tell him what his salary will be comfortably in the six figures, and benefits, and here's your office. Everything is wonderful. And then he asks the question, what will I be doing? What will I be doing? Well, you're going to be working with the people. Yeah, I know that. But what am I going to be doing? What, what does this company make? Well, we make computer guidance systems for missiles. He says, do you realize what I just went through to get out of doing that? No, no, I'm sorry. You, you, you can't pay me enough to do that again. And he ended up taking what you might consider, or the role would consider menial work. He made a decision to protect his spirituality. 
while he's a spiritual man. And as Jehovah's people, we may even take on jobs other people won't do. Ephesians 4.28 says we work with our hands, brothers. In other words, Jehovah's Witnesses, we do windows. <laughs> we do windows. We do floors. We're not afraid to get our hands dirty if that's what it takes to care for our family. We have a peculiar view of our jobs. Now, in the world, there's a lot of pressure on you to view this job as your career. This is your career. Be somebody. Make yourself into something. It's your career. But Jehovah's Witnesses do not buy that. We don't buy it at all. Our real career is our ministry. That Remember, we put our bodies on the altar of sacrifice. The minute we went beneath that water, you know what our career was? Being one of Jehovah's servants. That is our career. So at the very most, our job, we may like our job, we have a certain loyalty toward our employer, but that job is a means to an end. It's not our career. So we'll make decisions other people might think are crazy. We mentioned a brother named Richard at the outset. He was offered a promotion. He told me he turned it down. He turned it down because he said meetings and service are more importance to me than more money. We're not afraid to quit. We don't want to quit, but if push comes to shove, if we're in a situation where we have no choice, Jehovah's people may have to quit. I remember talking to a sister some years back. This was kind of a sad story. Uh, she was working in kind of a mom and pop type business, family store. And uh, she got romantically involved with her boss, and she had sexual relations with him. She felt bad about it. She was repentant. But here was the problem. The elders said to her, look, sister, please, please, please quit that job. Why? This was not some big corporation or office where you could hide out on the other side. She was going to have to be this close to this man eight hours a day. They said, sister, why put yourself through that? Why put yourself into temptation? Well, the sister cried, and she, she made an interesting point. She said, are you brothers going to pay my bills? Let me tell you something about this sister. You see, this sister has a physical disability. And she had found that there was a lot of prejudice in the job market against people with physical disabilities. And she feared she wouldn't get another job. And she said, are you brothers going to pay my rent? Well, the brothers tried to reason with her as a spiritual person. We turn to Hebrews chapter 13. Notice what the Bible says in verse 5. There's reasoning only a spiritual person could appreciate. There we read, Let your manner of life be free of the love of money while you are content with the present thing. Notice this. For he has said, I will by no means leave you, nor by any means forsake you. So that we may be of good courage and say, Jehovah is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Sister, do you, do you really think that if you take a stand for Jehovah and do what's right, do you really think God is the kind of God that's going to leave you high and dry? Is he going to abandon you? Is he going to let you starve? Not the God we worship. Have faith that if you take a stand for what is right, you have his back. What decision did she make? You know, I don't know. I've often wondered. I hope she made the right decision. What are some decisions you may have to make on the job? Have you ever been asked to lie, falsify reports? I recently spent the weekend with a brother that was a truck driver, and uh, I don't know what he was hauling. He said, I had to get out of this job. Why? He said, I had to lie. It was the only way to survive economically. I had to lie, and that lying was working out conscience and it was dragging me down and here I've been the truth 30 years and still didn't qualify to be a ministerial servant. So we had to get out of that. Or perhaps we're in a position to say no politely like the sister that was a receptionist. This is the true story. She was an executive secretary and so forth and her boss would say tell them I'm not in. He's in there sipping coffee. Tell them I'm not in. And believe it or not she would get him to to write a little thing that said, I'm not in. And people would come to the desk, where's Mr. Such-and-Such? -such? He handed the car. That was her way of handling it. 
solutions, what I call creative solution problems. One brother was asked to lie for his boss, and he made a decision. He said to the boss, I won't lie for you. You see, if I lie for you, I could also lie to you. Now, I've never, ever lied to you. Please don't ask me to lie for you. You know, you need a manager. Now, things don't always have neat solutions like that, but Jehovah does bless us when we make the right decision. These days, more and more of our sisters are in the job market. Some of you may be new to it, and you may now be realizing that things have changed out there, haven't they? But more and more of our sisters are facing what we recently discussed in the way sexual harassment. We're talking about exposure to dirty jokes, lewd remarks, being touched, called pet names, in some cases downright proposition. They say 30 to 80 percent of working, working women are exposed to it, what decision have you made about it? Have you made a decision? See, you make the decision before it happens. Make the decision before it happens. How am I going to handle it? What's my view of it? How will I respond? Uh, some women actually feel it's kind of the spice of life. One woman said in a survey taken by Red Book magazine, what would a day be without a little bit of flirting? Flattery from the opposite sex. Well, it makes her day. But that should not be the viewpoint of Christian women. Number one, we know that that little bit of flirting and touching is about something. It's the opening move in the game of seduction. Inevitably, the man has one thing in mind. I'm not being unkind. We're just speaking the truth here. Now, it's true that not all men who tease and flirt actually have sex on their mind. Some men, that's just the way they relate to women. They may not necessarily have bad motives, but at the very least, the Christian woman views it as an affront to her dignity as a Christian woman. In other words, we don't take it. We make a decision right up front to reject it. If we giggle in embarrassment or act as if we like it, men often interpret it as, well, she, she must like it. The best way is to set boundaries. Kindly but firmly let that individual know you don't know, stand for it. Here's what one sister says. She said, one day at work, a young man suddenly kissed me on the back of the neck, even though I'm married. Said, Wedding rings mean nothing to these men. She said, I was so astounded and angry, and she read the March 15, 1987. This goes back, March 15, 1987, Watchtower, Women in the Workplace. She says, I put it into practice. What did she do? I approached the young man and said to him in a serious tone, I did not at all like what you did or the way you acted. He was so surprised he answered, excuse me, I'm sorry. Now he understands my position. Now if we've made the right decision, we'll handle it well, and we'll do some other things. Because we've made the right decision, we'll watch the way we dress and groom ourselves. We'll watch what kind of conversations we get into with the girls at work. And we let people know who we are. It's not a secret that we're one of Jehovah's Witnesses. That may prove to be a protection. What about you sisters that are housewives? A dying breed, perhaps? But the world has done a number on you. The world says, oh, get out there and work. Get a job. Do something with your life. Your brain is going to rot in that kitchen. And sometimes even Christian women buy that hook, line, and sinker. Well, that's not what the Bible says about the housewife. Actually, it's rather surprising to see how much dignity the Bible gives the housewife. Let's look at Proverbs 31, and let's see if the housewife gets to be a decision maker. Husbands, you may want to take note. Proverbs 31 explains in verse 10, the capable wife is very valuable. And now he explains why. 13. She has sought wool and linen. She works at whatever is the delight of her hand. So she's industrious. She's not simply watching the talk shows all day and listening to transvestite nuns and cross-dressers and all kinds of weird and bizarre things. So she's working. She's busy. She may even have time for the ministry. Some of our sisters are able to auxiliary a regular pioneer in that setting. Verse 14, she's proved to be like the ships of a merchant. From far away, she brings in her food. Why from far away? That's where the bargains are. She's an intelligent shopper. She knows where to go. She knows how to save money. Then uh, verse 16, brothers, this one may shock you a little bit. She has considered a field and proceeded to obtain it. Now, imagine that. She swung a real estate sale. 
without her husband, brothers. She went out, she saw the property, she liked it, she surveyed it, she wheeled and deal, she closed the deal all by her little self. She's a businesswoman. As a matter of fact, she even has her own business. Look at verse 24. She has made even undergarments and proceeded to sell them. And brothers, if you have this fantasy that the capable wife every day said, Honey, here's this money I made today. Take it. I don't think so. <laughs> because if he trusted her to handle real estate transactions, believe me, he trusted her to handle her own money. And oftentimes husbands think that our wives should be like little children on an allowance. Honey, can I have five dollars? What do you want it for, dear? Our wives are usually a lot happier when they have a little bit of economic independence. And they're a lot nicer to be with because they feel secure and they feel trusted. No wonder that the Bible says in verse 31, let her works praise her even in gates. Yes, she helps her husband to qualify as an elder. He sits in the gates. She is a decision maker. She has a brain. And brothers, I'm going to have to blow the whistle on this one. This has uh, kind of been a dark secret for many years, but it's time for the truth to come out. Some of you sisters are so capable. Some of you sisters are so capable. You're even more capable than some of us husbands. Okay, it's out. And it's a fact of life. You know, uh, we men, we make money. That's what we do. We, we work. But some of us are not too great at handling money. And some of us have figured out that if we write out the checks, they're going to be bouncing all over New Jersey. But if we let our wives handle this, and they do it quickly, neatly, competently. Now this is a challenge for sisters. If you're a capable woman and the husband doesn't seem to be too capable, it is therefore very tempting to take hold. Sisters, don't make that decision. Understand that Jehovah has put the man in a certain position, and he has therefore given every man somewhere inside the abilities to do it. Sometimes we just need a little bit of courage to get some of that good stuff out. Now, I remember uh, when I was a kid, my mother pretty much was the head of the house. Dad worked, but she did all the discipline. She did all the discipline. She was wearing herself out. And one day my sister acted up and she, my mother finally says, why am I killing myself? I have a husband. So she says to my sister, your father is going to take care of you when he gets home. And my sister's mom, yeah, right, sure. <laughs> Jenkin in my boots. When dad comes home, she says, Wendell, Sandra acted up. She needs a spanking. My poor dad, she, she, she needs a spanking. So he very gingerly put her on his lap and he took a little swipe. And you know that wasn't too bad, he kind of smiled. Another swipe. Another, another, another. And Mom actually had to stop it. No, she got into it quickly. You know, sometimes it's just a matter of drawing us out a little bit. Here's the way you work with a man. When we do right, lavish us with praise. I so appreciated the way you took the garbage out. You might say, why do I have to say that? Because we men want to be for praise. And we respond to that, but we respond poorly to criticism. You never take the garbage out. But a capable woman learns how to work with a man. Interestingly, on the job, some of you are secretaries. And how many of you walk in and go, you forgot to send out that letter. How did you ever get to be an executive? Or do you say, you know, uh, uh, aren't we supposed to send that letter out? Thank you for reminding me. We can be so gracious with this world we may know about our husband. And we can show our capability by uh, encouraging him to take the lead. Thank him. Thank you for con conducting that family study. I so appreciate it when you take the lead like that. And they, that may help that man to rise to the occasion. You young people, you too are decision makers. Now, what music do you listen to? Now, your parents may screen what they see in the room, but they have this little invention, Sony Walkman. And this allows you really to, in secrecy, listen to anything you want. What are you listening to, son? <clears throat> uh, Kingdom Melodies 4. <laughs> and Dad says, since when does Kingdom Melodies 4 have a beat? What music do you listen to? When your parents aren't around, when you don't know what you're listening to, we've gotten lots of counsel on this. Are you using your head? 
say, are you using your head? I'm talking to young people on this. I said, are the lyrics of some of these songs bad? And they sit there looking down at their feet. You know, be honest with me. Are some of the lyrics bad? One young brother came up to me and says, Brother Wars, I've got to confess to you. He says, the lyrics are bad. He says, do you want to hear it? And I went, hmm. okay, well, what is it? I can't tell you from the platform what was in that song. I can't tell you. He says, I, I, it's going through my mind over and over again. Use your head. Use your head. Think. Make a decision. We know they'll let you into R-rated movies. They don't care whether you're 17, 18, or 14. You can get in. But use your head. How's it going to affect you? Your clothing. Do you let your peers determine what you wear? You've heard of being a slave of fashion. Young people ask once put it this way. What do you call someone who's at the beck and call of somebody else? Who gives in to someone else's whim and fancy? The Bible answers, don't you know that if you keep presenting yourself to anyone to obey him, you are slaves of him? Do you want to be the slaves of those kids in school? And they tell you how to wear your hair, you have to wear this, you have to do this. Use your head. Make decisions. And when it comes to your relationship with God, you may inherit your parents' hair color or height or body build, but you can't inherit their relationship with you. With that, you have to well, time does not allow us to go into the many hundreds of situations our brothers are facing. Perhaps some of you, after this meeting, have some big decisions to make. But remember the point. The foundation of a decision is our dedication. If it's time, if it's in harmony with God's will, in time it will smooth out. Brothers, we entreat you by the compassions of God to give serious thought to the decisions you make. We cannot afford to procrastinate, put things off, take things lightly. Our decisions can have life-affecting consequences. Have you ever thought of this? All the wars, all the crime, all the sickness, all the disease, all the problems that afflict mankind exist because two people decided to eat a piece of fruit. Doesn't that sound crazy? But it happens to be the truth. They didn't think of the consequences of their decision. Likewise, we reap what we sow. If our view of matters is worldly, fleshly, what's in it for me, short-sighted, our decisions can destroy us spiritually. But if our decisions are guided by a love of Jehovah and a desire to live up to our dedication, we can make wise decisions. And what will result? The psalmist said this in Psalm 1, verse 1. He said, we'll be happy. He said, happy is the man whose delight is in the law of Jehovah. And there in verse 3 he says, for everything he does will succeed. And may you likewise succeed in everything that you do by making wise decisions. All 168, thank you very much, Brother Waters, for giving us that uh, discourse and helping us to see how we can make good decisions that would please our God.